So some other people, uh, some other diets as form is also called, uh, one of them is the low protein diet. Okay, so what is different than a low protein diet and why? So the minimum level of protein is always uh, at least 18% if you're a little bit high. And the reality behind it is that, uh, the rationale behind it is that sometimes it's given for behavioral issues because the linkage between high protein um, to um, energy level and hence behavioral issues, um, that's where the linkage is. And that is why the idea behind it is that if I don't give you so much energy, you are not so energetic and hence it may help with the behavioral issues. Um, certainly for weight loss as well, as we know, a high protein diet would probably uh, would usually lead to uh, increase in body mass. And hence, if you're wanting to lose the weight of uh, your little dog, it may be considered to be giving a low protein diet. We don't, uh, it's certainly, because it's low protein, we do not use it with growth phases and reproduction. Okay, because it's a big no-no, remember, remember this. Okay, no low protein diet for growth phases like uh, when a growing pup, so for between the age of you know zero and potentially even up to 18 months, if not at least a year, don't give any low protein diet because your puppy needs to grow. Reproduction as well, the bitch is already giving so much energy in building bones, building new live babies. For goodness sake, please do not put it on a low protein diet. That's not good as well. It's not healthy. Okay, so it's used quite specifically. Definitely not for growth phases for young growing puppies or reproduction. So the advantage of that is uh, it's supposedly it's uh, better for gastrointestinal health because there is lesser protein in the guts and hence it may lead to less um, putrefaction is another word for saying a like rotting. Okay, so because it is less, uh, there is less protein over there. It doesn't cause as much issues to amend or rather change the gut flora, okay? And it's been linked to question mark longer lifespan because of uh, potentially better GI health and because they are maintained uh, uh, sort of a low level rather than being quite highly energetic. But that, like I said, I put a question mark over there. So there are just some studies that uh, discusses that not exactly proven. So disadvantages does include increased risk of coprophagia. Coprophagia is a very fancy term for saying eating its own poop. Because it is so low protein, the idea is that the dog may not get all the nutrients that it needs, all the energy that it needs, and hence they eat its own poop again in hope to draw out all the nutrients inside there. So there's an increased risk of that. that it doesn't definitely cause it, but increased risk. Potentially, you are limiting the amount of amino acids. So amino acids are the little building blocks for protein. So if you give a low, low protein diet, potentially we are limiting the type of amino acids that your dog may need. Okay, another diet to discuss about is hypoallergenic diet. So we've heard that being discussed before. So what is different than hypoallergenic diet? Okay. So usually it's indicated for dogs with skin or gastrointestinal sensitivity. It's a novel protein, uh, hydrolyzed protein. Okay, let's talk about that. So for skin uh, and gastrointestinal sensitivity, so some form of allergy, some form of sensitivity to some particular uh, potential food allergy, so to speak. Okay, and the idea behind it is that they use novel protein. Example, if your dog has been eating chicken and rice diet or chicken and rice based diet, then they get a skin allergy. You may want to give it a novel protein like um, ostrich and sweet potato. Something totally different that your dog hasn't been used to. And hence, the idea behind it is that if it's not been exposed to it, it shouldn't be allergic to it. Okay, so the whole idea of using a novel protein like duck and potato or um, yeah, so there are all, a lot of different uh, meats out there that's novel. Sometimes what they do is they use a hydrolyzed protein. The idea behind that is that, example, if your dog is allergic to, say, chicken, what happens exactly is that if you can imagine the molecule of the chicken, okay, and on top of the molecule, there are little spikes, okay, that, that causes the allergy. So hydrolyzed protein is they break the molecule down to much, much smaller molecule, still chicken, but it's much, much smaller molecule that there isn't any more of that spike to cause that irritation or the allergy in the first place. So the idea is that, yes, it's still chicken, but it's because it's hydrolyzed, the, allerg uh, the, the, the allergic part of it is no longer there. 
We also have things like low-carb or grain-free diet. So low-carbohydrates or grain-free diet. So you've certainly heard of that. So what is different? So minimal to no grain as a source of carbohydrates. And the idea behind that is that nobody really, puts, nobody really wants to put grain because grain has been used uh, as a uh, big component of the cereal-based diets. And hence, uh, it supposedly uh, cause a lot of poop to be formed, but you know a lot of it is because the dog cannot digest it. So they talk about grain-free or low carbohydrates. Okay, so minimum to lo no no grain. So uh, rather than using maize, wheat, rice as a source of carbs, they use things like a uh, sweet potato uh, as a source of carbohydrates. Okay. Then uh, talking about the potential starch digestibility as well, whereby it is just different sort of starch. Okay, and um, interestingly, uh, 2019 there uh, there has been a paper that mentions about mycotoxin that's being linked to grain uh, or cereal-based diets. Okay, and this had a huge scare of saying that okay, so anything that's cereal-based it has got a higher potential of spreading mycotoxin, okay, which is not a nice uh, toxin at all. However, in the same year, grain-free diet has also been linked to heart disease. So they did a survey and they looked back and they found that many dogs with heart disease, many of them, they are actually on grain-free diet. So the question is whether there's a link between feeding a grain-free diet and heart disease in the dog. So the jury is still out there. Two fairly uh, sort of, I, I wouldn't say elegant papers, but fairly well-written papers, but contradicting uh, the pros and cons of using a grain-free diet. But certainly that diet does exist as well. Whew, okay. Now, vegetarian or vegan diet, yes, they do exist in dogs. Be very, very clear about this, not for cats. Cats are obligate carnivores. They have to eat meat, okay? But dogs, apparently, well, not apparently, they can actually go vegetarian or vegan. And um, usually, usually, okay, not all the time, and this is where I'm going to get shot down, and I do apologize for that. Usually, this is done because the pet's owner um, is a vegetarian or a vegan. So, uh, and hence, they want to have the similar sort of ideology, the idea, the principles for their own pet as well. I'm not judging right or wrong, I'm just reporting. So it's usually linked to the owner's belief, okay, entirely possible in terms of nutritional requirements due to the omnivore status, okay, because unlike cats, they are not obligate carnivores. Uh, so it's entirely possible. So special considerations when we put them on a uh, or rather, if you want to put them on a vegetarian or vegan diet, would be similar to people who are vegetarian or vegan. Um, includes a protein, calcium, you know, vitamin D, vitamin B12, taurine, L-carnitine, omega-3 fatty acids, particularly DHAs and EPAs, because these are usually found in meat. And a potential risk does include alkaline urine and nutrient inadequacy, if you're not very sure what you're doing. Um, that can cause all sorts of weird symptoms and signs.